So my name is Mary Kaplan and I am the Information Outreach Specialist here at the Forum Press Center. Um, today we are super excited to offer you um, what we hope will be a five-part series on uh, the U.S. Congress. This briefing specifically will look at the role the U.S. Congress has in the legislative process, uh, its relation to the executive branch, and how its interactions with the president change due to party composition. And to help us do that, we have two well-qualified uh, speakers with us from CQ Roll Call. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce David Ellis. Uh, David is the Chief Content Officer and Senior Vice President of CQ Roll Call. He has spent more than two decades covering business and politics in both the United States and Europe, and uh, with well-known publications such as Time, People, and Money Wise. Second, I'd like to introduce Steve Comero. Steve is the News Director and Vice President for CQ Roll Call. Steve began his career as a local uh, reporter here in Washington in the 1980s and has worked foreign policy, defense, and domestic policy beats with outlets such as the Associated Press, USA Today, and Bluebird News. If you'd like to learn more about either of today's speakers, we do have bios available at the signing table. Um, so David is going to speak first. He's going to talk to us a little bit about CQ Roll Call. And then Steve is going to go through his uh, presentation on um, Congress, and after we make our way through that, we will open the floor for questions. Um, before we get started, I would like to ask if you could silence your cell phones if you have them. Um, feel free to use them to tweet or take pictures or record audio through the presentation, but we'd like to ask that they remain silent for the duration of the program. And I'd also like to remind you that the views represented here today belong to our speakers and are not those of the U.S. government. So with that out of the way, I'd like to introduce um, Thank you, Mary Catherine. Um, good morning. Um, glad to see you're all staying warm. Um, I have a great affinity um, with this group because I was in another world, um, one of you. Um, I was a reporter based in New York, and I decided to go to London to give London a year and stayed 14 years. So in that period of time, I worked for uh, Bloomberg News, and I ran that magazine, Money Wise, that was referred to earlier. And in that period of time, particularly when you were covering Parliament, it's a difficult challenge when you're an outsider. Uh, the word that I got a lot was your non-voting press. You know, we, we, you talk to an audience that's not going to put me back into office. And so uh, I considered it a great achievement uh, being able to grab David Cameron for 20 unsupervised un, uh, minutes to talk about foreign policy. And you understand at that moment, it's not due to your great pluck or persistence, although you need that to, to do well in a foreign posting. Uh, but it was because David Cameron was leader of the opposition and needed to burnish his foreign policy credentials and needed to talk to uh, a foreign news organization in which to do that, particularly one that was American-based. So I have a great affinity for um, what you guys are trying to do, and I understand it. Um, if any of you have covered local uh, congressional campaigns or have traversed the country, I suspect you'll find Americans pretty accommodating and open, even if they're not particularly well informed about the country you come from. Uh, so today we're going to talk about Congress, those lawmakers who make our laws, and how they go about their business. Uh, Steve is a experienced uh, hand in Congress, so he kind of knows the ins and outs, so you'll be getting some very valuable information about that. And we're going to, you know, we hope to make this a conversation rather than a presentation. Um, now, as Barack Obama enters his last year in office, there's been some surprising signs of cooperation between the executive and Congress, uh, and also some no-go areas. And we're, So this, this year, this lame duck year, as the president exits and then those who want to succeed him rise to prominence will be very, very interesting. And it's a kind of, it's a really great year to be covering Washington and being in the United States. Uh, so we'll, he'll, we'll be here to talk about that. Let me tell you a little bit about the organization we both work for. It's called CQ Roll Call. CQ started as a thing called Congressional Quarterly 70 years ago. It was to bring sunshine to the workings of Congress. It was started by a gentleman named Nelson Pointer, who ran a chain of newspapers and understood that there, the workings of Congress were very opaque. Uh, and we needed an organization not only to feed his 
newspaper chain with the workings of Congress, how things were working, how legislation was made, who's responsible for it. But also, he considered it something of a quasi-public service. He felt that a government agency that covered Congress wouldn't be able to police itself, and that the only best way to do that was to have a private company, which was answerable to its shareholders or its readers or the people who purchased its goods, in order to cover Congress. Um, it started around 1945 as quarterly reports on Congress, and the name C2 became pretty much a misnomer almost immediately because it started to have a weekly report, and from that point it grew. So CQ was never really quarterly, so but still referred to as Congressional Quarterly up on the Hill, but it's basically a daily news operation with about a, a hundred reporters and editors. It's behind the paywall. So people pay a great deal of money to get the advice that she's going to give you for free this morning. Um, a couple of years ago, the Economist Group, which owns the famous Economist News, well, we call it a newspaper in the British way, but it's actually a magazine and everybody else. It owned Roll Call, the Capitol Hill newspaper, and it bought CQ. So the company combined, CQ, Roll Call. CQ is behind the paywall, Roll Call is before the paywall covering the workings of Congress and the congressional races. The best way I can describe the difference between the two brands is that Roll Call is about the pursuit of power in Congress, and CQ is about the exercise of power in Congress. And that's what we're talking about today. So the person who will be doing most of the talking or giving you most of the wisdom is my colleague Steve Comero. Uh, as it was mentioned before, he started on Capitol. He was an old hand on Capitol, worked in the Senate the Senate gallery, wasn't it? Yeah, both. So he knows the uh, workings of Congress and the personalities behind Congress for uh, quite a long time. From there, he became a defense correspondent, tra uh, lived in Europe, traveled to Iraq several times, and uh, we'll tell you all sorts of war stories after this session today if you'd want to hear them. He joined uh, CQ last January. He's been pretty much a transformational presence We've become much more aggressive. We have a lot of scoops. I hope in the, in the, in the, uh, we'll have some occasion to talk about how this summer CQ actually influenced the workings of Congress with, with its coverage. And um, it's a complicated institution with two distinct bodies, with two distinct sets of rules, and 535 people who think individually they're the most important person in Washington. <laughs> So um, how to navigate that is difficult, and you need the other thing I would tell you is the best thing you can do if you're up in the gallery is make friends with a CQ reporter. We have a lot of experienced people. They're almost parliamentary experts, and some of them have deep experience in their particular areas on how money is spent and how Congress makes laws. So to talk about that in some detail, here's my colleague Steve. Thank you, David. Uh, this is a, another reason this is a good time to come to Washington and cover Congress is because the new speaker, Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, uh, has said that he wants to legislate. He says they want to follow regular order. Regular order means following the rules as people expect them to be as opposed to uh, the chaotic business that Congress has been doing for the past few years, uh, and uh, we're going to see that process start very soon. The president will submit his budget beginning of next month, and that is sort of the starting gun for the race to get all the spending done, which is still Congress's preeminent power under the U.S. Constitution, and to get the other legislating done that they want to get done this year. Uh, the headlines will be dominated for sure by the national political campaigns, but Congress will be getting a lot of work done in the shadows of that and will be influenced by that, and they will be trying to influence the campaigns themselves. So it'll be a very interesting time in Washington. Um, we prepared a slideshow, which is probably too much information, but we'll distribute it to everybody here afterwards so that you have it. But this is kind of how the process is supposed to work. And I've been given a clicker, and I'm hoping that this will move through it. Okay. 
what starts out. Congress has committees on every topic uh, out there, including foreign policy, spending, defense, uh, health, the judiciary, uh, transportation. Uh, Congress often focuses 99% of the time on domestic concerns in the U.S., but can get very excited about foreign policy issues. You're seeing that on the Iran deal right now, uh, and you'll, you'll certainly see it uh, as uh, trade comes to the forefront later this year. Uh, China is a hot point in, in Congress very often. Uh, the news about uh, China's slower growth uh, today will certainly get some reaction on Capitol Hill. So uh, this is pretty basic, but let's go ahead and whip through it. A lawmaker introduces a bill, seeks co-sponsors. Sometimes uh, you'll have a whole majority of uh, the House or the Senate co-sponsoring a bill, and you would think that would guarantee passage. No. But it, it improves the chances. So they go and do that. The bills get referred to a committee, uh, and then for major bills, the committee will schedule a hearing. Uh, the committee uh, takes the draft of the bill and starts to manipulate it. We call it a markup. That's the term we use. And they literally mark it up with a pencil and uh, produce a final legislation that will go up to the full committee. Most of the work is often done at subcommittees, which are fairly specialized. Um, once the full committee passes the bill, it goes to the floor of the House or the Senate start with the House as a speaker. Okay. So you guys, if you're not on the list or not on his website, you should be looking at uh, the majority leader's website in the House to see what the schedule the following week is. That's, you know, uh, the House follows its schedule pretty rigorous, rigorously. Uh, the Senate is another matter. The Senate doesn't really have a schedule but the leaders do try to give you a heads up on what's coming. Uh, the second item there, if you uh, are watching C-SPAN, the leaders of the two parties will have a little colloquy on the floor at the end of the week and talk about the following week. Um, if there's a bill you're particularly interested in, you can always go back in the congressional record and read that again, and they might give you some hints on where we're going. Uh, at the bottom, minor non-controversial bills go to foreign suspension of the rules. This is sort of a speedy process, usually happens at the beginning of the week, and the bills will just fly through. Um, these, are, these are ones where there's very little uh, controversy between the two parties. Again, more contentious bills or major bills go to the Rules Committee. The Rules Committee is a committee in the House of Representatives that the Speaker controls, and it sets up the rules for the debate. It'll say how long the debate should last, how much time each side has to debate it, and what amendments will be allowed for votes on the House floor. As you see at the bottom, the committee does not vote on the bill itself. Instead, it sends a rule to the House floor, and you'll often see a vote on the rule before you see the vote on the bill itself. Okay. Let me go right through this one. Uh, there are four types of rules, just to give you a little more detail here. Uh, an open rule means that any debate, uh, then there's basically no time limit on a bill. This is pretty rare, but they'll do this sometimes. Uh, and when uh, Mr. Ryan talks about regular order, he's going to have to do this sometimes on these spending bills. Let, pe let everybody offer amendments and basically wear them down. A modified open rule, it restricts what kind of amendments come in, oftentimes it's restricting them uh, to the topic at hand because an open rule, you can uh, uh, offer all sorts of amendments that may or may not be directly related. Structured rule uh, is, is just a more, a more clever way of restricting uh, the amendments. Uh, sometimes there's uh, if, if A, then B structure. Uh, and then a closed rule means that there's almost no amendments allowed, and uh, you'll see this often when uh, there's a, a bill where the leadership, in this case the Republican leadership, doesn't want uh, any alternatives. They have counted votes. They want a bill going to floor a certain way, and 
if, if amendments are offered, those amendments might actually pass and then ruin the chances for the bill eventually passing. Okay, so the House debates the, debates the rule. They, they, when it says vote on the previous question, that's essentially voting on the rule, and then they vote. It's big news if it's defeated. Uh, it's a failure of the leadership if, if a rule gets defeated. It means they weren't counting very well. Then you have your debate, etc., and, and a series of votes. The way the House works, uh, and I hope you all have been up to Capitol Hill, is a normal vote is 15 minutes. And because there's hearings and things going on at the same time, they'll sometimes pack votes together. So the first vote will be 15 minutes, and then they'll have a series of five-minute votes afterwards. So the members can come to the floor, and they have to vote in person. There's no remote voting. Uh, they have to come to the floor. So this will pack the votes together so they can get their voting done in a more efficient way. Again, if allowed by the rule, the minority may offer a motion to recommit the bill. You'll see there's Nancy Pelosi. Uh, this is uh, the Democrats trying to send the bill back to committee, in other, in other words, defeat the bill. Most cases, though, the bill goes ahead and it's passed. And there's the Senate. Unanimous consent is how the Senate works. Uh, if any senator objects to something, he or she can cause trouble. So. What you'll often see on the Senate floor is the leaders will work out a deal and ask for unanimous consent to get something done to move ahead. Cloture is a way of ending debate on a bill. Uh, there's a, a famous old movie in the U.S. called Mr. Smith Goes to Washington where uh, Jimmy Stewart plays a, a senator who tries to kill a bill by talking forever. In the Senate, the Senate rules, you can, once you start speaking, you can just keep going and hope that the rest of the Senate gives up. Cloture is, is a method in the rules that allows them to end the debate after a period of time and move a bill forward. In these contentious times where, there's, where the chamber is, is fairly evenly divided, we see this a lot. We see a lot of cloture votes. If they get closer, then they can move to the bill itself. I'll distribute this so you can see these details. There's, there's, there he is. We're seeing the old movie. Uh, filibusters today are rarely done in that manner. I think uh, Ted Cruz made some headlines when he was uh, reading uh, Dr. Seuss and Green Eggs and Ham, and more or less a classic uh, filibuster, but it, it really wasn't quite the same way. The rules uh, just don't work that way anymore. Okay. We put in appropriations here because the one true power that Congress has in terms of legislating is the money. Congress controls the money. And You'll, you will go through this this year. Uh, President Obama, we're seeing it right away. He, in his State of the Union address, he suggested hiring more uh, agents for the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And immediately the Republicans were saying no. And the way they say no is they won't approve the money for it. Often these, these jams get Congress all the way to the end of the fiscal year, and they haven't passed the bill, so they pass stopgap bills. And that extends the current budget year into the next year. This is where we, we look for, for trickery. The appropriations process often goes off the rails a little bit, and things happen. Uh, David mentioned that sometimes just careful, carefully watching Congress causes things to change, and we did that at CQ this year. Uh, there was a debate over the use of Confederate flags on federal lands, and the House, in an appropriations bill, had passed uh, legislation basically banning the Confederate flag from federal lands, and this is uh, a, a 
issue that was in conjunction with the uh, killings in South Carolina and the taking down of the flag, of the Confederate flag from the state capitol there. Well, after Congress had voted to done this in the House, they had voted to, to end the use of the flag there. Uh, there was an amendment that came up late in the evening that basically undid that. And it never even mentioned the Confederate flag in this amendment. But our reporters got suspicious and, you know, ran down, found out what the language did, you know, referred to section so-and-so and this and that. And un they uncovered it and they, the whole appropriations process came to a halt because of this attempt at some trickery. Uh, on the hill, and uh, it never really recovered. We ended up going to the end of the fiscal year without individual spending bills passed. I should have mentioned the spending bills in regular order, what Paul Ryan's talking about is the bills that in the different topic areas are approved to provide spending for, say, the Pentagon or the State Department or the other federal agencies. There are 12 separate bills. They all got sidelined, and we ended up with this giant mess at the end. One of the, one of the uh, things we talk about are the sequesters or the spending caps on total federal spending. This is in lieu of working out the details. Uh, the Republicans and Democrats have worked out a spending scheme. In fact, they passed the two-year budget last year, which will carry over this year. So there's an overall cap in spending, and they have to work the bills within that cap. This is just to familiarize you with some of the terms. An omnibus bill, a cromnibus, and a minibus bill. These are ridiculous terms that have become popular in Capitol Hill, but you need to sort of learn what they are. And this is generally what happens at the end of the fiscal year. Uh, an omnibus bill is a bill that, contain, is, as the name suggests, could contain almost anything. Uh, a minibus, by contrast, is, is a, a package of a few bills that, uh, that they'll push through. Oftentimes, it's just to round up votes. They can't get enough votes on the individual bills, so they package them together and make it must-pass legislation. You approve this bill, or the government will shut down. And that's the threat. And so they'll move ahead with that. OK. Uh, we'll distribute that to anybody who wants. Um, now, I was also asked uh, briefly to talk about uh, the last term of the president. And uh, I can answer questions on this, but the two issues come up in the last term of the president. One is vetoes. Uh, oftentimes, we've seen historically that in his last term, a president will veto more bills than, than in other years. The Congress is, is already looking past that president, trying to pass bills, especially when we have divided government. We have a Republican Congress. We have a Democratic president. They'll be passing bills to try to help their candidate. Which candidate that is, we sure don't know yet. But they'll be trying to do that. And the president will be trying to make dramatic points by vetoing bills. Now, Barack Obama has been uh, reticent to veto bills. Uh, the president, in his seven years so far in office, he's only vetoed eight bills. Uh, if you go back to the last Democrat, uh, Bill Clinton, in his two terms, he vetoed 36. And if you go back in history a couple generations, uh, Harry Truman, who was in office roughly the same time that Barack Obama has been in office, during that time, he vetoed 180 bills. In addition, he did what's called a pocket veto, which is that when the Congress uh, uh, passes the bill. If the president doesn't sign it under cer certain circumstances, it just dies a quiet death from him not signing it. So uh, we have that. The other question that came up, uh, and I can answer a question on, are presidential orders and presidential actions, because we're hearing a lot of that from Barack Obama, and this is a strategy that he uh, adopted from Bill Clinton, which is to do as much as possible without going to Congress. He knows that he's not going to get Congress to do certain things. For example, gun control. He just did a, a presidential action which is uh, aimed at tightening the screening of people who buy guns. 
so uh, he did that. Congress would, would not approve this. Uh, presidential actions can be huge. Uh, in, in American history, probably the biggest presidential action of all time was President Lincoln issued an Emancipation Proclamation, uh, which uh, declared that all the slaves were free. Uh, this was during the Civil War and had, of course, uh, a dramatic impact on the war and on the history of the United States. Uh, other actions are, are pretty small. Some of them, uh, presidential orders, are uh, in secret. They have to do with, with spying and, for example, when the president ordered the uh, uh, operation to capture Osama bin Laden, you know, this was all done in secret. Uh, a lot of the orders that on how the CIA operates, for example, are done in secret. So there's a broad range of these orders. Uh, they are they are published uh, eventually, except for the classified ones, and and you can look them up. Uh, the one thing about a presidential order is that while it may have the force of law while that president is in in office, in most cases it can be turned around by the next president. Uh, it also, if it's deemed by the courts to not uh, follow the laws of the United States, it can be thrown out. So uh, they have they have their limits. And I was going to add something and then ask you a question. Okay. I, I, I wanted to point out on, on executive orders because as of last year, uh, this president has set aside more federal land uh, for uh, uh, as national park land and uh, restricted it from development than any president had done two terms or more, two terms, one term or two in history. So he has one year left to continue signing executive orders under the Antiquities Act, which was established under Theodore Roosevelt. So he's already made, him, made himself a historical figure on set-asides. And as Steve mentioned, they can be overturned even on day one from the next president though it's highly unlikely for any president to come back and say that marine uh, preserve in the Pacific is now open to fishing or that national park, he established three national parks, I think in Utah, California, I can't remember the other state. No president is going to come in and say, okay, we can now turn that over to a Walmart development. So there are certain things that are forever simply because once you do them, they're not popular to, to be undone. And we saw a second step into policy just last week where he signed an executive order restricting um, development for oil on federal lands. So last year it was rather non-controversial national parkland and beautiful landscapes. This year it's taking it a step further to set aside land from exploitation in the future. That will probably be overturned by a Republican president, but practically in, a, in an era of low oil prices and increased alternative energy sources, it would not, it could possibly not be practically undone in, in reality. To go back to, to Congress, Steve, I wanted to just ask you, because one thing I think we want to add to that PowerPoint presentation are the 12 bills, the 12 major bills and what they, what they actually fund. But with all these confusing bits of language and various power centers and two sets of rules between the two chambers, can you talk briefly about if we're going to, if, if, if you're a new correspondent to Washington, what committees should you be looking at? What are the most important committees? What are the ones that drive that process that we're talking about? Sure enough. Uh, well, if I were coming in from overseas and I was interested in focusing on a couple committees, there's really two. Uh, one is uh, the Ways and Means Committee in the House, Finance Committee in the Senate, which are the ones that handle taxes and trade. Trade is going to be a big issue later this year, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the betting now is that will actually come up before Congress after the presidential election in what we call a lame duck session, where the new Congress isn't seated yet and the new president isn't seated yet. So uh, those, those, that pair of committees, and the other is appropriations, which I just mentioned, and if you're zooming in on foreign affairs, there is a, a bill that includes the funding for foreign aid, 
and the State Department and other entities uh, that deal with international uh, affairs. So, you know, I, I would guess that you're less interested in the transportation bills and that sort of thing. But all, all sorts of issues can come up. Of course, defense is, is the biggest of the domestic spending bills, which is, has great international impact. Uh, and uh, presidents have great sway over defense. Uh, the Pentagon has great sway over it. Uh, you'll see in the United States that the defense companies have great sway over it. Uh, a, a project like the F-35 jet fighter, they spread the contracts all around the country so that it becomes politically difficult for any member of Congress or any, any senator to vote against funding for the jet. And that's, that's become basically normal process uh, here in Washington. Uh, presidents sometimes fight over money on defense. Uh, Barack Obama certainly has argued for reducing spending in many cases. Uh, uh, one of my favorite examples of an executive action was under Theodore Roosevelt a hundred years ago, where he wanted to, he was very bullish and very pro-defense establishment, building up a navy. Uh, they built what they called the Great White Fleet, which was a huge navy fleet, and he wanted to send it around the world. And Congress wouldn't send, give him enough money to send it all the way around the world. So he sent it halfway around the world, and then he asked Congress for the money to bring it back home. So uh, they can be they can be kind of crafty. I wanted to talk about politics, obviously, because um, Steve alluded to that whole idea of spreading expenditure across countries in, into different congressional districts. Um, a lot of these defense uh, contracts also in, entail foreign companies. Uh, eject receipts being made in Prague when we're expanding NATO and maybe a little bit of an engine being done by Airbus. And, uh, so you, you, you can see those patterns. What you could look at is some of the weapon systems that the Pentagon itself has said they don't want to fund or have anymore and look at where those things are made. Uh, you may be surprised. Uh, Amtrak, the National Railway, which loses money and is often a whipping boy, for people who, who don't much like uh, government involvement in transportation in that level. Uh, there are entire routes that go through, very low-traveled routes. So you may know Amtrak as the uh, not, not very nice as your own home network uh, train that goes between New York and Washington. That's the highest level of Amtrak service. There are, there are uh, routes that go through congressional districts in, in rural areas that are actually a drain on the finances of Amtrak and probably should have been done away with a generation ago. But because they have a constituency amongst the lawmakers along that route, they're not going anywhere. Uh, when you're not in the Acela train, the trains you are taking on Amtrak are the original trains from 1970 and 71, which may explain why it takes so long for them to, you can't get any Wi-Fi and they don't have any way of ringing up your, your coffee. So that kind of infrastructure, um, the, 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 the cap on infrastructure and then the expenditures across, you can see that even in places where you, you come from because, again, some of these large weapon systems will have, uh, have contractors that are involved in their creation. So there's, there's that, that's something to look at as well. And our foreign policy, I think we want to talk just briefly because we've got a presidential campaign um, very much, you would think that foreign policy is very is a very important issue for the U.S. Congress, and yet when you look at what they're doing from day to day, it isn't. So the, thing, the important thing to remember about foreign policy and lawmakers are, it's not important until it is important. And so right now, because China is a very large economic rival to the United States, you'll see in the President's State of the Union address and a lot of stump speeches by the candidates. China, foreign policy and challenges from other countries are being framed by, in, by China. Well, China has more engineers than we do. Well, China is growing at 6% and we're growing at 4 That That's the reason why we're now starting to use China as a touchstone for how economic power. And on the other hand, of course, we have uh, debates about Im immigration 
so you'll see over the next year or so, uh, China is an economic power and an economic rival. Immigration writ large, uh, but with specific emphasis on the fear of terrorism. And then trade, because there's always been a constituency on, in both parties that the North American Free Trade Agreement was harmful to American business. And those arguments are being uh, posited again. And the reason Steve is alluding to that being passed in a lame duck session is because the power centers in both parties want the deal, but they don't want the actual passage of the deal on the, on the wrong side of the election. So that if you put those two things together, you can see what, can, what are consensus issues that both parties possibly don't want to be seen in, cons in, in agreement on that will be passed right after November 8th. Good. So, some questions? Uh, Hi, my, my name is Celia. I'm a journalist from Barcelona in Spain. And well, I just arrived here in September, and it's been really difficult for me to understand the, the, the functioning of the Congress, especially because it's so different from some European systems, which are parliamentary, and so the person doesn't have that power. Okay. So my first question was um, regarding the, the relationship between the president and the Congress. Does the president have the capacity to veto any bill first? And second, uh, these executive actions, can he um, use them in any topic? For example, I'm, I'm thinking about Guantanamo. He spoke about Guantanamo again in, this, in the State of the Union, and I don't think the Congress is really willing to do anything about Guantanamo in the sense he wants to. So to what extent he can use the executive action, and to what extent what he does regarding this issue uh, can be sustained uh, by a Republican president afterwards? And my third question is, uh, when uh, Boehner was changed or uh, substituted by Ryan, what exactly happened there? I mean, what, yeah, I didn't understand what happened there. Why would, it, I mean, what, to what extent Ryan is different to Boehner and, and in what sense? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, let me say, the president can veto any bill that Congress sends him. Uh, Congress can override the veto if two thirds of the Congress in both chambers uh, override the president's veto, and then it becomes law without his signature. Um, presidents don't veto every bill they don't like because it's all about compromise. So they will, uh, if a bill is sort of barely uh, acceptable to him, uh, he's not going to veto it. Uh, he'll let it go through and save, save the ammunition for something else. Uh, there have been exceptions. I cited Harry Truman. I mean, certainly sometimes the president wants to uh, uh, put off an image of being strong and vetoing a lot of bills might play into that image if it's handled correctly. Um, the second question was... Oh, Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay. Bay. Well, there, there's some debate about the Guantanamo Bay Authority. Uh, Congress uh, does not want it closed, largely because they don't want the prisoners brought to anybody's district in the United States. Uh, and uh, the legal arguments are going on. Uh, the prison was created uh, by the White House. It wasn't created by legislation. So in theory, it could be closed that way, but Congress has ways of blocking things, including cutting off money and doing other things. So uh, Congress can make it very difficult and also difficult politically uh, for the president on that. Uh, what Obama has been doing, and it just happened in the past week, we've had more and more of the prisoners from Guantanamo are being sent back to other countries. A, a group of Yemeni just went to Oman, for example. And this has been a, a constant process, and like three quarters of the people who were originally at Guantanamo Bay are now gone. Uh, Obama has gone out of his way not to add people to Guantanamo Bay. I mean, it built up over time. It wasn't on day one right after 9-11 that it was filled up. So uh, he's been doing what he can to reduce it, and there is a lot of suspicion that he will do an executive action of some sort uh, to close it before he leaves office. Uh, there are things uh, he could do. They talked about moving people to the brig in South Carolina with the military facility uh, or other things, but the numbers have to go way down uh, before they can close it. You have to get down to you know, the last 50 or so. Uh, 
and then a follow up. I mean, yeah. if, if a president uh, uses executive action for several things, for example, using one channel or, or um, or if he wants to protect his legacy regarding important issues like, for example, the land deal, climate change, mm -hmm. I don't know, and anything related to Keystone, uh, oil pipe, etc. Is there any way he can protect this legacy that sometimes he has achieved through executive action and that's why uh, maybe if there's a change in the White House, this next president can over... over uh, right. Yeah, the next president can undo a lot of things. There's no question about it. But some things are just, as David mentioned, too unpopular to undo. Uh, the example of Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, that was not going to turn around. The North won the Civil War, and that was the end of slavery, and that was it. Uh, but, uh, for example, Keystone might be an example. If a Republican took the White House, might be much more open to uh, pipelines going through. Uh, I would, you know, just to say that, I mean, that's where politics plays here. The best thing he can do is get a Democrat elected to succeed him. So he'll be raising money, and when they get through the primary, he'll be supporting that person. Um, I agree with Steve. Context is everything, and um, the president signed an order within days of becoming president in 2009 to close Guantanamo, I think, within a year. It's highly un if he leaves, and there are large numbers of prisoners in Guantanamo, or indeed even one, that he will be signing on to an, an absolute certifiable failure of his presidency. So he's got 12 months to get these guys to third countries uh, and get that number down to a place where, as commander in, in chief, he can move them somewhere. I think that's pretty likely. Uh, uh, it will be very controversial, and uh, it might be another thing that happens after the November election. Um, so you have that. Um, the, so remember, executive orders are available to any executive, so the next executive can come and start undoing them. But on Guantanamo, he's clear, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a promise unfulfilled by this administration. So the question is, on January 20th at noon, when he becomes this private citizen again, uh, what is that a failure or is that a, a last bit of business that's been done? I would bet last bit of business done. How will unfold quietly over the next 12 months? Another um, thing to understand is he's starting to set out his stall as a private citizen and as a power broker in the Democratic Party. I mean. No, is there anybody from Britain here? Uh, the, the, he will become like our Queen Mother, or he's the first African American president. He'll be relatively young, ex president. He writes very well and will no doubt get a spectacularly large advance for his memoir. Uh, he, this is a guy who wanted to be a novelist and a writer, uh, and he's already starting to set out his stall. He wrote in an op-ed page on the day of the State of the Union that he would not support nor campaign for any Democrat who did not support gun control, in some ways holding his successors and all his wannabe successors to maybe a higher standard of delivery on that subject than he himself has done. Uh, does that mean? Who's speaking? Uh, he's also uh, mentioned in the State of the Union about gerrymandering, the creation of congressional districts that are designed to entrench the current incumbents. That may be something he's campaigning for. So remember, once he's no longer president, the person who will be undoing his orders might be being opposed by him. So the politics is starting to creep in, and the bottom line to you, for your question is uh, electing a Democrat is a lot better for his executive orders to live on than a Republican. Now, Boehner and Ryan. Yeah. Um, John Boehner had been saddled as Speaker of the House by a not insignificant group of what we started calling the Tea Party, but then they refashioned themselves into something called the Freedom Caucus. It's at this point about 40 members. Uh, the caucus, that group, that informal group, has strengthened in three successive elections, and they're not very happy with Washington. They're not interested in the word compromise. So in some, some ways they have 
stepped away from the, one of the core requirements of legislating with an opposition party, which is compromise and taking things on that you don't like. Um, when you were talking about the veto, Obama has signed the, uh, in the spending bill, there were provisions that was chipping away at the funding for uh, the Affordable Care Act that he definitely didn't like, but they were smaller things within a larger, greater good, so he signed it. So Boehner has had to operate, had to operate with these uh, groups of, this group of naysayers who didn't like actually coming to, in coalition with Democrats to pass things. And this was most acute when the U.S. Senate passed the first comprehensive immigration reform bill in a generation. It never got to the floor of the House of Representatives. Yet, it would have become law. The way it would have become law, it would have had enough Republican votes and a majority of Democratic votes to get passage. But John Boehner was not willing to bring that, that bill to the floor because he didn't want to be seen as being dependent on Democratic votes to, to have a major piece of legislation. They have in certain other instances, he did in certain other instances, depend on the Democrats to bring him over the top on certain other bills. At some point he got fed up with that situation and gave way. So Paul Ryan, what, what is behind the scenes for Paul Ryan's first months of his speakership is to accommodate the uh, Freedom Caucus, bring them more out to committees, standing committees, have uh, term limits on, on committee chairmen to give people more prominence, trying to bring the naysayers that bedeviled Mr. Boehner into his particular tent, at least temporarily. The other thing that Ryan has done, which a lot of people, which is y unique, is that he's taken on the role of Speaker of the House, but said he's only committed through this Congress. So there may be a situation that he's always had that, I think, to say, if you guys don't help me uh, at least look a success, I'll move on. So I think, that, is there anything yes, else? Sir. No, I just, I mean, his appeal also, of course, he's a national figure. He had been a vice presidential candidate. And there are those of us who are suspicious that if the Republican nomination process goes entirely off the rails, there's Mr. Ryan, you know, canned, rested, and ready to be a candidate again. We'll see what happens. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is, is Takumi Kobayashi with Trigger uh, News of Japan. And, um, I'd like to ask you something about the, the Congressional Research Services reports. Mm -hmm. uh, the reports make a big headlines in a uh, newspaper in the country as a matter of practice. And, uh, but uh, uh, honestly, I don't know much about the how things work in the uh, So uh, I wonder if you could tell us about the uh, what kind of people are writing and editing the reports. And, uh, exactly how uh, influence, influential that report could be to uh, among the congressional leaders. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Congress, uh, because individual members uh, don't have the capacity to do it as the executive branch does, Congress has created some agencies to help it do its work, and, and the Congressional Research Service is one of them. The congressional Budget Office is another one where it does budget research. Uh, both very prestigious. Uh, the research service does reports, uh, largely it requests the members of Congress, but it follows uh, various issues. And uh, I'd say that their reports are considered very uh, influential, especially on Capitol Hill. Uh, they'll be cited in legislation. Uh, we certainly uh, consider them uh, very authoritative. Uh, the agency is supposed to be nonpartisan, uh, so uh, they're considered fair and uh, and accurate, and uh, uh, they're they're of great great value in this town, along with uh, the other congressional agencies. But there is a twist to that, which is because they are first of all, there's a, the Freedom of Information Act uh, does not apply to Congress, so we can't uh, require the release of congressional research reports if the member doesn't want to release them. So when the the commissioning member will release it, they're usually, usually widely available. But perhaps a member will ask CRS for an investigation into something and he or she won't like the conclusion. They could possibly sit on the report. 
Uh, it's also not very transparent as to what they're working on at the moment. Um, so what happens is there's a bit of a cottage industry in this town where people obtain CRS reports that, uh, from inside the agency. So what you have in effect is a government agency of researchers and economists that in an agency that cost the U.S. taxpayer $110 million, and yet their work is not available to the public uh, as, as a force of habit. There's a, a piece of legislation certainly in Congress uh, to make all CRS reports unless they're dealing with national security issues and therefore may have classified information within them, make all those reports and the schedule available. Um, CQ would support that. We're n we are ourselves a nonpartisan organization, a private organization covering Congress. And so we know what fair and accurate information looks like, and CRS reports are in fact that. But because of this anomaly about con lack of accountability and transparency to con of con to some laws, effectively, the CRS reports can often not be available to the public. Um, but if you Google them, you'll see you'll get many of them. So uh, that's information that you can trust as a reporter. If that's the nut of your question. Hello, Hi, I'm Stefan Grover with Euronews. Um, I have uh, some, some very, very practical uh, questions. And you mentioned Mr. Smith uh, going to Washington. So uh, let's, let's picture any new member of Congress uh, who gets elected. And many of them are not constitutional uh, law experts, right? How do they get up to speed um, concerning all the sometimes very arcane rules uh, in Congress? How, uh, who decides? In what on what committees they will be on, and um, what about their staff? Is there a limit to the size of the staff? Uh, are there legal limits, or can any member of Congress hire as many as he wants? And and how does that work? Okay, uh, each member of Congress comes to town with a budget for their staff, and that that is essentially the legal limit for their staff. Uh, there, is, there are groups that do training. When the new Congress is elected, you'll see them coming to town at the end of this year and getting training. The Congressional Management Foundation is one of them. And they, they sort of learn a little bit about the process there. Now, a member of Congress, usually even before they're elected, they're thinking about what committees they'd like to be on. And that is up to their leadership, the speaker, the Senate Majority Leader, the Minority Leader in the Senate, the, the Minority Leader in the House, and they will place people on the committees. Now, most members are on more than one committee, uh, usually one that they really want, and maybe one or two they don't want quite so much. Uh, the Appropriations Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, those two are very, very popular because they're doing important legislation and uh, they get into a lot of topics. If you're on the the, the, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee in the House are known as the College of Cardinals because they get together and they decide where the federal spending goes to a large extent. As a footnote, spending bills originate in the House of Representatives under the Constitution. So that group is very powerful, and, and a lot of members want to get on Appropriations Committees, and often in a very specific subcommittee. For example, if you're a Washington, D.C. area member of Congress, you really like to get on the Transportation Appropriations Subcommittee because there's so many road and transit problems here. Or you might want to be on the Defense Subcommittee because there's a big defense industry here. So, uh, they, you know, if you're from Kansas, on the other hand, you probably want to be on the Agriculture Committee. Uh, and that's how that process works. The, the other thing, to, if you're looking to uh, develop sources, is there are certain powerhouse legislators who are known to have the best uh, committee. So they may not have a bigger budget. Also, there are separate committee. The committees have separate permanent staff, staff. Permanent staff. Yes. Both in the minority and the majority. So those are also entry points. People can move between a lawmaker's office and a committee. Um, they're really valuable people to know. They're the people who know more about parliamentary procedure than their bosses. And when there are strong, powerful lawmakers, they draw talent. So uh, the late Senator Edward Kennedy of Massachusetts was known to have the smartest, most engaged, most powerful group of 
idea makers and, law and, and legislators and thinkers. Melody Barnes went on to the uh, uh, Obama administration. Paul Kirk, who I believe was his chief of staff, actually succeeded Senator Kennedy in the interregnum after his death and the, uh, the election of his successor was on the, on the following January. Uh, so what I would be looking for, if you're looking to develop sources, is look at the people who used to work on Capitol Hill for those kind of people. And that's a really good, valuable lunch to have, you know, to, to, to pick their brains and to find out who the powerful people are now on the Hill. So, so it's, a, it's a fixed budget, but the variation between staffs is wide. And the reason it's wide is because you know, there are superstar lawmakers and you want to work for them and they attract other stars and it's a, it's a virtual circle. Also, if you're, if you're a senator for life, you're going to have people, uh, you know, and sometimes staffers, uh, Dick Luger, who was the uh, Republican uh, senator who was friends with uh, Barack Obama and they worked together on uh, loose nukes when they were senators. Uh, Senator Luger was seen as out of touch and lost the primary to a, uh, a, a challenger in the Republican primary. And an entire swathe of very talented people wound up being distributed to other offices and then other think tanks in this town because, you know, if you're having, a, you have a senator who's there for, until he or she decides to retire, you have a really good core of people. And, and, and in, a, in an uncertain world of politics, that's as close as you come to job security. So those are the people to look for. People used to work for Kennedy, used to work for Luger. They know friends here. They observed it. They've seen the whole arc of how things work. And they can see the differences, the, the things that are anomalies now in this Congress and this political atmosphere to when they were there. That's all that we have time for today. Well, uh, I should just say, I hope you all take this home. We have a thing called CQ Weekly. This is a review of the best we've uh, best stories we've done over the last six months or so, including a cover called "The Next War." We'll start by accident, which is ten days before the Russians and the Turks had a little bit of a contretemps over a fighter plane. So please take a look at this, and this will, I hope, help you in your search for understanding of this crazy Congress. Those are all available at the signing table, uh, signing table, in case you didn't see them. And also, just a heads up that we will be doing a uh, local reporting tour um, to the Senate press galleries. Um, so keep a lookout for that invitation within the next week. Thanks, everyone, Thanks. for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs>